I guess I'll give a little bit of background about Sage. So as far as I know, Sage was born of William Stein back, I think, in like 2004. Please do not look that up and then yell at me if I'm wrong about that. Uh, it's not something that's super prevalent to me. So what Sage originally started out was software for algebraic and geometric experimentation. But eventually this algorithm got dropped because really uh, no one cared. They just called it Sage. So what I'm going to show you is just an introduction to Sage and basically uh, some of the features that you can use with it. But I'm not going to go too far into the actual content of what Sage can do, just how to write some basic programs in Sage. There's my worksheets. Now, as soon as this loads up, uh, so I've already started Sage up. And I've loaded what's known as a worksheet in the notebook, which is the notebook is this kind of nice interface here that you can uh, type stuff in and share between various people. So let me just delete all the output there. So let's check to make sure that Sage is actually running. Great, two plus two is four. Every good introduction to Sage talk will start with two plus two equals four. I don't know why everyone does 2 plus 2 equals 4. Maybe someone's expecting it 5, but I guess it only happened for one year out of history. Anyways, enough with the literature jokes. Let's do some more basic computations. 2 to the 8th is 256. My favorite number, but I do a little bit more software than probably most people in here. Uh, let's do some fractions. 1 half plus 5 is 11 over 2. 2, OK. Now let's do some bigger things. I'm just going to trust that that's, it. that's what the value is. If anyone wants to check, go right ahead. You should definitely get something over 49, because 7 squared is 49. How about really big numbers? How many digits do you think this has? Well, you're probably wrong. But the point is that Sage can handle arbitrarily large numbers without, uh, or at least arbitrarily large integers without uh, misstepping. And what about modular arithmetic? It can handle that too. Question. Yes? How large? I mean, there's no limit. As big as your memory can withstand, which nowadays is pretty big. Plus operating, minus operating system, and Sage, and all the other crap that goes on. So let's start with variables, because everyone loves variables. You were taught probably way back when you were about 10 or 15, somewhere in between there, what a variable is. Same thing in Sage. And we can call it whatever we want, as long as it doesn't begin with a number. For uh, obvious conflicts, I mean, 5x. If no one would know how to interpret that, whether it's uh, the number 5 and then x and you mistyped, or the variable. So let's do some basic manipulations. 25 plus 2 is 27. Great. We can do some polynomial type equations. Now, with Sage, there's many elementary functions that are given to you for free. And sometimes they might have some unusual names if you haven't actually done any sort of programming before. So we can check if a certain type uh, or a certain function already exists by starting to type it in as FACT, for example, here. And then I can hit tab, and I get what's known as all possible tab completions. And here you can see there's both factor and factorial. So I want to look at factor, and I want to factor x, which I've done down here. And Sage knows how to factor integers. And I can do things like sine. Well, 
sine of 25 is sine of 25. There's not an easier way to write that. But cosine of pi is minus 1. And Sage knows how to convert that uh, fairly well. So just to slightly recap, functions are generally uh, named as under, with uh, lowercase letters with underscores separating uh, different words, such as this function name, as you can see up here. Whereas if you actually create a particular object, like an integer or a ring, it's going to follow what's known as camel case, where you have a capital letter, and then the rest of the word in lowercase, capital letter for the next word, and so on. Yes? All right. So I'll, cop I'll copy the large number. I will create a new cell. And there's the factors. All to the 9 12th power, or in the case of 2, it's uh, squared of that. And if you, know, you can check 156 should factor as 4 times 3 times 13. Okay. All right. Uh, so, I'll, well, I was going to get to this later, but it's actually evaluating 156 to the 9 12th first because it's inside the parentheses. Pimp, you know, good old order of operations. But just to prove it, I will now factor y, and it still knows how to do it. And I have a question. Yes? So can you recover the powers like 1, 8, 2, 4, 9, 1, 2 uh, from factor of y? You want the powers yeah. from that? All right. So I'll call my factorization z. And then I'm just going to try and do stuff. There you can get the powers. But I'm using a little bit of wizardry and uh, insight knowledge to know that I should type list of z, which I will describe what all of that means and what I tried in a second. So I was talking about things like objects, things like integers. Well, x is an integer. And there are certain operations we can do on integers. And to be able to access that, we have what's known as the dot operator. And what I do is I just go x and then dot. And then I can use tab completion. And you can see all of these nice methods which act on this integer. So I uh, will just pick our favorite factor. And note, I don't need to pass anything to factor. That's because the fact that it's a method that there's this dot here, it implicitly knows that it's operating on x. And then, you know, I can do things like x plus 26. That's, op that's done first because of parentheses uh, have the highest precedence in terms of ordering. And then factors. Some more fun. 127. I can factor that. And I can check if a number is prime, and so on and so forth. So you may not always know what these, all these methods do. I mean, there is a whole list of about 30 of them right there. So I've pulled up one here called radical. And then to check what it is, you can just hit a question mark and then evaluate it. Evaluate it. Quit being stubborn. And what it's doing is it's going through the process of loading its documentation. It should be. And being extremely slow at it. So in probably about a minute, it'll pop up. So uh, did I redefine x somewhere? 
I think I might have redefined it, so let's just be safe. No, it's... No, excuse me. All right, so, so it seems to have wanted to just completely get angry at me because I'm trying to rush this too fast. So let's try this again. This is only because I'm giving a talk right now that something like this will happen. In the US, we call this Murphy's Law. All right, I've created X. I will not get its documentation. And there you see it does radical. Let's see if I can get its documentation this time. No doesn't want to do that. Ah, there it's documentation. Huzzah. It does eventually work. So you can see it just has, tells you what it does is it uh, takes the products of prime divisors and then uh, takes their product. And you can see some examples down here. So the radical of 25, the only prime factor is 5. We discard 1, of course, because that's not prime. And the product of 5, well, there's nothing to take the product of, so it's 5. So let's do our minus 100 here. And now it's caught up again. I think I'm going to have to yell at someone. All right. No more getting documentation for, for now on for the rest of this talk because that seems to not work with my computer for whatever reason. You're running the, you're running the server on your computer, right? Yes. It's just a local little server. Yeah, I could, I could run it on the Sage server if I wanted to. But, uh, so, but, you know, for now, this is typically how you end up working with the notebook. It's just within uh, your own little local server. I tend to do things from the command line, which kind of does away with any possible idiosyncrasies of the notebook. So take the radical of minus 100 here. But this should scream wrong to a lot of people because in that documentation that's now gone, the radical of negative 100 was actually 10. And the reason for this difference is order of operations. The fact that the dot has higher precedence than that uni unary minus, that minus out in front. So it's actually doing the radical of 100 first and then taking the negative of that. So I have to put the negative 100 in parentheses and I get 10, like we expect. And let's try and do something stupid now, like divide by 0. Uh, yes? So uh, can you summarize uh, detect which, uh, you suppose you apply some functions and operations. You want to detect which, uh, which is preferred first and which is the next. So can you do it somewhere? Uh, there's a standard order of operations pretty much across all programming languages. Um, you can find this available online in certain places. Um, and this, it's rare that something like you do negative hundred dot radical, but every once in a while this might end up biting you and it's just this is kind of a precautionary statement um, this if you've done like c plus plus programming uh you would see you see a lot of like or well more c i should say you have parentheses dereference variable name dot and 
the reason you need the parentheses there is the exact same as you do here. It's an order of operations statement. All right. So yeah, we try and divide by zero, and Sage gets really angry at us, as we should expect, because dividing by zero is unhorribly evil. So we can see by clicking in this space to the left that we can expand out this trace back. And that just basically tells us what has transpired inside of Sage to render uh, the problem here. And of course, I mean, it's just mainly a bunch of displaying garbage and then saying, look, we can't divide by zero. So just as a quick little foray into something that's actually Sage specific, well, it's more Sage specific, I should say. I'm just going to talk a little bit about polynomial rings since this technically is a Sage uh, discussion here. So polynomial ring, with polynomial rings, there is a bunch of different ways you can create them. For example, I can create polynomial ring over the rationals with the variable t. I can get its generator and I can do basic computations exactly in the same way as you could before with uh, rational numbers. Here's an alternative way to create a polynomial ring. And here I've created a polynomial ring over another polynomial ring, but that's okay. I can do computations again. And you'll notice that it's actually collected the terms in T before the terms in Q. And that's just by how I've constructed this polynomial ring over the other one. I mean, this polynomial ring S is the same as the rationals adjoined uh, Q and T. But to Sage, it, it doesn't quite know that. So it collects terms by Q. And then subsequently it collects terms by T, which in some situations can be helpful when you want to actually display what's going on. Because you care about, you grade by Q and you want some polynomials in T. I can create multivariate in the same sort of fashion, just now with two generators. And, oops, as I add extra characters, I can do computations as well. And it's just, instead of collecting terms by Q and T as before, or in this case A and B, it orders them in a particular order, in this case, degree by reverse lexicographic. So, some basic operations, but a lot of times when you're programming, you want to create a certain sequence of things. And in Sage, and more generally Python, there's two types of data, uh, two types of objects that can do this. The first one is a list. And you can create lists just like this. Nice, simple, straightforward. And you can have multiple entries, and they're stored in the exact same order that you give them. So, you know, 1, 2, 3, 6, 8, 2, minus 2, 1. Well, it's stored in exactly that order. And there's lots of methods and functions on lists that you can do. By lots, I mean there's about 12 of them, or 20. But you can pretty much do everything you want with some combination of these methods or functions. So I can sort. Great. And if I look back at my original list, it's exactly what I started with. However, if I run the, the, the method sort instead of the function sorted, it, goes, it doesn't give me any output, but that's because my list has sorted itself. It's changed itself. So you might have to be careful of that. Or this might be the behavior that you want. But just be warned, you can get different behaviors. So 
Another very important thing about Sage is that it's zero based. So if I want like the index of three, which just returns the position of three in the list, you can see, does that show up? Yes. You can see three is at position five in the list, but because it's zero based, the first, the first one is at position zero. And you know, position one, position two, position three, and hence three is at position four. Index also gets the first occurrence. So index of one is one, because it's at position one. I can also get the element at position three with uh, calling with the square brackets. And like position zero, you can see it's minus two, which is the first thing in our list. We can also use negative entries to look at list at the right, where the rightmost entry actually corresponds to minus one. So minus three should be three. And you can see minus one, minus two, minus three. And then the next thing we can do with list is we can take slices. So a quick way to get a, the slice is just basically a sublist. So with no values on either side, it gets to the, if, it, if there's no value to the left of the colon, then it gets everything to the left. If there's nothing to the right, it gets everything to the right. So for example, like just the slice one four is position one to position four, non-inclusive. The left side is inclusive, the right side is not. So they're always half open intervals. But a more concrete demonstration, this just gets uh, position zero and position one. This gets position four, five, and six. And then I can also take steps too uh, by adding another colon and then how much I want to step by. Quick yes. Yep. Uh, that will give you the entire list. Yes. As we can see up here. So there's no exclusivity with the order. Correct. So, what is the thing with three numbers? So, this last number is a step condition. So, it steps by two. So, you can see it starts at one, and then steps to two, and then steps to six. And this also takes minus numbers, which step uh, to the left as well. So the other object that uh, encapsulates the idea of a sequence is called a tuple. And the difference between lists and tuples is that tuples will never, ever change, at least the ordering of the elements. I can get really, really ugly with certain tuples. So if I create a tuple with a list inside, I can change that internal list. So don't ever do that, please. Uh, so here's a tuple. And I've created with my original list. And again, like I said, if I wanted to, I could go and change that list there. So there's, like I said, a little bit of danger. This is not recommended practice. to have lists as elements in a tuple. But, as, but tuples can take any type of input. And lists actually can take any type of input as well. I mean, their elements can be any type of object. And I can play the same sort of game and get the index. And the index of x in this tuple is 3. I can run sorted, which returns a list, not a tuple. First, first sign that something has changed. You can see our tuple, again, remains unsane, uh, unchanged. Excuse me. We can get slices. And here I'm just getting everything uh, except the zeroth and the last entry. I'll create a smaller tuple to work with. And you'll notice that this notation is kind of odd that there has to be a comma there. 
but otherwise there'd be no way to distinguish it with just a parentheses of a single object. Why would you do that? Well, there may not, there typically is not a reason for it, but they still have to be able to distinguish this syntactically with you know, being able to read it and understand what you're trying to do. So that's why you need a comma, technical mumbo jumbo. So what's the reason why we want something that we can't ever change other than maybe some peace of mind that you know this object won't change? Well, it's exactly that peace of mind that is important for this thing called hashability. So if an object can't change, I call it immutable. And for something to be what's known as hashable, it has to be immutable. And why you want hashability is you can feed it to these other objects called dictionaries. And dictionaries are basically maps from keys to values. But for the dictionaries to work correctly, some technical conditions are needed. Uh, and that kind of technical condition is actually hashability of your keys. So for example, here's my little dictionary. I map 1 to 56. And then my tuple uh, consisting just of negative 2 to 4. And then I can retrieve values. So the image of 1 in this dictionary is 56. But if I try and create a dictionary with my list, it tells me it's unhashable. And that's because lists are still mutable. You can change them. But as I said, I only require the keys to be immutable. The values can be whatever you want them to be. So as this dictionary here, I've created the values uh, the, val the one single value here is a lisp, and that's okay. So that's all our basic building blocks. And now we, ha we want to loop over them because it's really, really annoying to write a program that just goes L of 0 does this, L of 1 does the exact same thing, L of 2 does the exact same thing, and so on and so forth. So how we do that is with for loops. And I've created a very simple for loop right here that just takes my original list and factors it. Ta-da. Another type of loop is a while loop. So it'll loop until the condition is not, excuse me, is not satisfied. So I have this little loop which starts at n equals 0. And then while this value n is less than 3, I will print um, a particular, I'll, per uh, I'll print n plus the, link, the list at position n. And then I will add uh, that position to n as this indicates. And it stops very quickly at minus 2 and 4 because 4 is bigger than 3. And so what it does is it goes n to minus 1. So it gets the last value in my list, which is 8. And hence we arrive at 4. We, no, sorry. My, it's minus 2. Sorry. We add 6. There we go. 6. Negative 2 plus 6 is 4, right? Or do I have to type that in? See, this is what I get for doing so much Sage programming. I can't add. I have to type it into Sage. So every once in a while, you'll be going along in your loop and you realize, crap, I need to stop. This, it, something is going wrong. And you can use what's known as a break. Uh, to, and this will exit out of your current loop. And if you want to just skip over the item, you can go continue. So I will go through the reverse of my list. And as soon as I hit a value less than 0, I will quit. Otherwise, I'll just print it. And you can see it just runs all the way up until I hit minus or hit negative 2, in which case it stops. 
and then I can skip over things. So now I'm going in the forward direction and I'm just skipping over the negative numbers. So using loops, I can actually go through and I can construct a new list using this following notation. And I'm just going to store the factored forms of the numbers in my list. And you can create tuples in exactly the same way. So this range function that I've introduced here is a simple way to create the range of numbers from 0 to n non-inclusive. So range of 3 is 0, 1, and 2. Add 5 to each of those, and you get 5, 6, and 7. Oops. So now we want to write functions, because just doing everything in one sequential block is boring, stupid, and won't get you very far. Because you, know, you have the same code block, and you call it in 20 different places. Well, you don't want to write the same thing 20 different times, especially when you have to go and change one little thing in it. You have to change it 20 times. You may have different variable names. Complete mess. So functions. This is how we do a function. We just do a def, and then the name of the function, and then arguments, which are the thi things that we pass into the function. So I'm just going to do the standard dot product. And so it takes two vectors, which I'm going to think of as lists. And then it does the sum of this list uh, where I just multiply the ith entry in each of them together. So there's a bunch of uh, Python magic starting to happen now. But you know, this is just trying to introduce all of it in a little bit of a short time. So if you don't quite understand all the magic, uh, don't be afraid. Uh, uh, I have a question. Though. Yes. So when you write your uh, def and also when you wrote your for, yes. you have indented the next line. Is that really necessary? Yes. It's a syntax uh, necessity of Python. It has to, every time you go to a different um, inside some loop, it looks at the index that you're at. Or sorry, the indent that you're at. Uh, this so the scope of the def would be all the stuff that's at the first indent level and beyond. Uh, yes. Well, welcome to Python. You don't know. That it, real, it really is that you have no idea what is going to be given to you. You can only assume that the user is not that horrible. And if it is, well, if it is really horrible input, then, well, your function has a right to complain. And it will su subsequently throw an error, which the user may or may not understand. But there's this concept called consenting adults that occurs throughout Python. And this is kind of the baby, ver I guess maybe I should call this consenting teenagers or consenting kids, since it's kind of the uh, baby version of it, where you trust your users will give you something that's not outright horrible, that it's at least in the scope of something you can handle. And there are ways you can test against this, but I don't want to go into that here because that's just a can of worms, a big one. So let's try and see if this function actually does what we want. I have the vector 1, 3, 2, and minus 2, 1, 0. And 2 times minus 1 is negative 2. 3 times 1 is 3, plus, plus negative 2 is 1, plus 0 is 1. Great. So we can provide default arguments as well. And there turns out to, to be a good reason to do this. Um, 
you should see an, an example later, uh, a, a better example than this little contrived one here, where I've just wanted to scale my vector, and if I don't pass a scalar in, then it should return one, or just it'll handle, it'll treat the scalar as one. So here's my function. I can scale this vector by three, but and if I don't pass anything in, it just returns the original vector back in essence because it one times any vector is the vector itself. And then we can also provide what are known as keyword arguments to a function. So each of the variable names or each of the arguments, excuse me, in the function have a name, a variable name associated to them. And if we give that variable name as we're passing it in, we can actually skip over certain inputs. So I've created this little more complicated function here, which just returns a string representing the subsets of a particular set X. And you know, with some extra conditions. Really, this is just a demonstration, so don't expect that this will actually give you the subsets of a given set. It will not. So, let's say I don't, I don't want the sub subsets that sum to a particular number, but I have some weight and some way to describe what those set subsets mean. So, I'm going to take the subsets of the set 1, 4, 2, and they're going to be weighted by, and I want them to be, have a certain weight associated to them. And this is probably the, the typical reason why you want default arguments, is because you want to give your user the options that uh, they can input different types of data that's treated somewhat differently. And this starts getting around a bit of the problem where, you know, okay, I want a function that takes subsets of x and then some extra data associated to it, but it could be data representing this type or data representing this other type. Well, it's actually better to have them as separate arguments and have some default arguments and have the user input a keyword. And then sometimes it's useful to have a function that takes an arbitrary number of arguments or keywords. And I guess I did, forgot to write this one. So here's my little simple function. And the syntax is basically you have a star in front of your variable name to represent arbitrary number of uh, arguments and then uh, two stars to represent arbitrary keywords. So I could do something like foo of 4, 1, 2, 3, 2, x equals 5, y equals 6. And you can see that args these number of argu arbitrary number of arguments is returned as a tuple and the keywords is a dictionary from variable names to the values that you've passed in. Or excuse me, not variables, I mean uh, keywords that you've passed in. So, there's all these wonderful objects that are already in Sage. But, often, as often the case, there's not the object that you really want in your heart of hearts that you dream about every night and think from night to day, man, I wish Sage had this object. Well, there's a way to actually write that yourself. And these objects are called classes. And a class is a set of methods and data that is basically packaged together for you. So 
what I want to do is I want to model the standard basis vectors of q to the n. And I'm going to represent that as this class uh, standard basis vectors. And I've given it a bunch of methods here. I've given it this double underscore init, this double underscore repr, this double underscore iterator, or iter, and this extra method add vectors. So only one of these does not look strange. And uh, really, all the, these first three methods are something that's specific to the Python side of things. So this first method, init, is what's called before anything else is called when you've created, when you want to create a particular instance of your class or actually create the object itself. And it's short for initialize. So your class should take, so how I've described this is that your class should take one argument when it's being created. And all it's going to do is it's going to set this attribute, this underscore in, to be this parameter that you've passed in. Because once you exit this function, you have no idea how to keep track of n. I mean, just like with any other function, it, it goes away. The repr is short for representation and is a, how, it, how the object should be printed. The iter is short for iterator, which is a, how you can uh, sequentially create uh, a particular list associated to your object. So blah, 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 computer science geek stuff, blah, blah, blah. Give me the damn example already. So standard basis vectors. I create standard basis vectors of q to the fourth. And now I'm just going to print that object. And then I'm going to loop over the list of all my objects and print each of those. And this is what I get. And you'll notice that the repr, the string output for that, matches what's called from the print statement. And then as you break down this iter function, you can see it just creates a list of, so of length n. That's what this little bit of Python magic does. It, so n in in is 4, creates a list of four with zeros. It puts a one at position x, where x ranges from zero, zero, one, two, and three. And then it yields it. The yield is what makes it an iterator. It's, it returns it, and then it stops at that particular point waiting for the next time it's called, the next iteration in particular. So the first time through, creates the list of zeros, and then sets the zeroth position to one. And that's the first guy right here. And then it knows that it's already done one, so it goes through that for loop again. Now x becomes one instead of zero, and puts the one at position one. And so we get the next guy and then so on for the last two. So let's try tab completion. Well, the only thing we get is add vectors. That's the only method that S knows. And you might be asking, why can't we access the in, that underscore n? Well, that's because in Python, anything that starts with a leading underscore does not appear in tab completion. It's hidden. It's private, which means that it should technically only belong to that class. No other classes should be able to access that. And this is, this is truly the full consenting adults thing, is that I can access it because I can access any attribute and any method in Python. 
And so now probably everyone's confused. Well, the short version is there's no, there's no true notion of private as in Python and hence Sage as there are in C++ or Java or pretty much any other programming language, any other standard programming language. It's never truly belonging just to that class and that set of objects. So I can actually go in and set underscore in to be two, and then I can return the corresponding list of elements in S, and you can see it's truncated at two, whereas where it should have been four. And that, that is the consenting adults, is that you do not go in and invade someone's private life. That's a no-no. So I can now, so now that I've deformed this into n equals two, I'm just gonna treat it like so. And I'm just gonna run, I'm just gonna create my list of elements and then map them to E1 and E2 using this uh, slightly funny syntax. But when you have two lists of the same size and you set them equal, it sets the positions, it matches the positions up. So you can think of that E1 comma E2 as being secretly a tuple of length two. And hence why E1 becomes one zero, E2 becomes zero one and then add vectors while I'm just checking to make sure it does exactly what we expect it to do. Now let's just kind of refine our problem a little bit and let's say we want to take vec basis vectors with just a one in the odd place. So the first one and the third one, the fifth, so E1, E3, E5, E7, and so on up to some particular n. But we don't want to have to go through this hassle of redefining everything we have in uh, the standard basis vectors. Because, I mean, there's, there's no reason to. So I can use this thing called subclassing or inheritance to take all of the structure of my base class, standard basis vectors, and apply it now to this new class, odd basis vectors. And in there though, you know, there's some additional features that you may want, you can add on freely, or you want to overwrite particular functions that are already present in the base class. So I've created my class odd basis vectors inheriting from standard basis vectors. I've given it a new representation and a new iterator, but the init method and the add vector method should be coming along for free. So just to demonstrate, ah, there it is. So create the odd basis vectors of up to five. So it's E1, E3, and E5, and it's done right there. I've had to do no, uh, I have not had to define an init method, and subsequently I do not need to define add vectors at all. It comes along for free. But the iterator, which is what's used in the list right there, I overwrote. And then if I just do O, it's over in the representation, the repr method as well. And then one last thing with Python is that you can take two different classes and inherit from both of them. So here's just a little skeleton example where I have three classes, A, B, and C, and class C inherits from both classes A and B. And this is just the syntax. 
And this pass down here is needed because in Python, as I mentioned uh, earlier, you're, it's the indents that tell you that you're inside of a class. But subsequently, you know, if you give it class, if I went like class C stuff colon, as is the syntax, and then I didn't want anything inside of it, and I went down to like the next line and did like three plus two is five, uh, Python would, would think this is a syntax error because it's looking for an indent and then some extra information. And that's what pass kind of is basically does, is it says, look, here's some information. There really is no information here, but it's to make everything syntactically readable and nice. But I want, the, the other thing I want to note is there's a little technical condition that has to do with the order of the inheritance. So when inheriting from multiple classes, there's an order in which you've passed in your classes. And this basically defines a total ordering on all your inherited classes. And this is what's known as the method resolution order, or MRO. And in this class C, it's inheriting foo from both A and B, but it's only going to call one of them. It can't call both of them. That would be kind of ludicrous. So the MRO for class C is A and then B. So if you call c.foo, it's first going to look in class A for that method, and then it's going to look in class B. So let me make this a little more interesting. So I've created my class C, and I call foo. And you can see that it calls foo that's been defined in A. But I also have access to bar that's in class B. And that's kind of my introduction to Sage and Python. And if it's not perfectly clear, because I did not say this beforehand, and I apologize slightly for that, but Sage is built upon Python. Everything in Sage is uh, built and you, is used in the pipe is using the Python interpreter. So anything you can do in Python, you can do in Sage. And that's kind of the premise and why everything is the way it is in Sage. So uh, thank you. Yes. Define short. It's short in the sense that uh, if you actually expect write it out everything in a proper way, then it takes a long, long uh, program to write it. But there will be some commands which will kind of help you out in putting it in a short manner. Like, like your, for example, your, your like, definition of short is not well defined. Okay, well, let me give an example in Mathematica. Suppose you have a certain list and you want to drop an arithmetic progression of numbers, or you are you want to introduce an arithmetic progression of zeros inside, there are very simple and short commands which would actually do those. But they're not simple and short. To you as the user they are. Yes, yes But exactly. inside Mathematica they're not. Uh, yeah, and yeah, they're, yeah, yeah. You know, th this is why I'm saying your definition of short is not well defined because this might be in Sage already, in which case it's short by your definition. Yeah, I, yeah. So lots of stuff on like partitions and Tableau and polynomials, like factoring polynomials, for example, is short. You create a polynomial and you type factor. But uh, I mean, if there's something like specific 
algor algorithmically, I mean, you know, it, at some point, you know, there's basic building blocks. And even within Python, they have lower level building, building blocks from that. And even within how Python is built, there's even lower building blocks. So I mean, it, it's a bit of a non sequitur to look at what defines short in terms of program length. Yes. So how does Sage uh, compare to Mathematica and symbolic computations? How is it doing symbolic computations? Compared to Mathematica, say? Because uh, I haven't used symbolic computations in Mathematica, I can't give a definitive answer to that. But polynom the best for computation symbolic wise in Sage is using polynomials. The rock polynomials are okay. Multivariate polynomials are pretty good. Um, univariate truly are the best. What about eigenvalues? Eigenvalues for matrices? It can do those fairly well, uh, up to some numerical noise with That's like symbolic. R. Symbolic, uh, if, you, if you create a matrix over a polynomial ring, it should be able to handle that okay. If you do it with arbitrary symbolic functions like cosine, and arctangents and some gamma functions, 50-50 uh, chance. But I mean, the more extreme you get with symbolic functions, the scarier stage can be as far as like, is, you know, I can't even say if it gives you like the proper uh, output. But uh, as far, I mean, Pretty much as symbolic computations go overall, I, mean, I would wager a strong guess that Mathematica is better at basic computations. But if you go more to research, especially like two, three years old type research in certain computations, then there's a higher probability that it's in SAGE. Just because we can output we output research code much faster than any other mathematical software to my knowledge. <laughs>